some simulation of ionization energies of single va single valence atoms. So with this, I welcome Professor Prashanna and Professor Prashanna, your windows is yours, please. Oh, uh, thank you very much for your very nice introduction. So uh, are you able to hear me and are you able to see yeah, my yeah. slides? Yeah. Oh, I can see your slides and also I can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. So, yeah, so hello everyone. And I'll first begin by thanking the organizers to have given me this opportunity to present a talk here. Uh, it's, it's spoken in QIQT 2021 too. And uh, keeping in mind the audience, the talk would be pedagogical this time too. So, although the title says it's quantum simulation of ionization energies of single valence atoms, I'll actually get to this topic a little later towards the end of the talk. So, most of the time, I'll just spend introducing each of these things. Um, so, yeah, I'll also spend some time towards the end of the talk talking about our institute. It's it's a new institute, a new center, not not as new as it was last year, but still new. So a lot of nice development. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about it towards the end. So here are my list of collaborators in no particular order. And uh, oh, I see, I'm not on full screen mode, is it? Okay, okay, yes. So uh, we'll first begin by looking at uh, quantum anybody theory. Uh, the idea being that when you're going to talk about uh, atomic systems, uh, you first motivate quantum anybody theory. And once that's done, then we try, we discuss the VQE algorithm because it is in the context of VQE algorithm that we actually want to find the ionization energy of uh, atoms that contain one unpaired electron in their outer shell. So, so when I say single valence atoms, that's basically what I mean here. So uh, we'll then introduce the VQE algorithm and then finally look at the calculations of atomic energies. Since they are ionization energies, We'll do two calculations. This is not an EOM kind of a work. So we do two calculations, one for the single valence uh, atom and then one for its closed shell counterpart. So we look at both these energies and their trends and so on and how the VQE algorithm fares there. And en route, we'll see why we are doing this work and what really motivates us. So it's more of a long-term perspective in mind uh, than we had when we first, when we first began uh, working on this problem. So then we'll look at some results very, very briefly. I probably won't spend much time talking about this and then we'll conclude. So of course, there are some really nice talks that covered similar topics. And so one was Professor Quick's talk on NIST computers and Professor Rahul had covered VQE, QPE and strong correlation. And Professor Sangeeta spoke about the basics of qubits and there are some very nice talks from QIQT 2021, which I may reference uh, while I discuss things in this talk. So we'll, we'll first begin by uh, just looking at uh, what, what the overall goal is. The goal is, of course, to just solve the Schrodinger equation, at size, e psi, and you want to solve for the wave function. And once you get the wave function, you can get any property of interest to you for, for any application that you desire by taking an expectation value. So some quick details here. The Hamiltonian here uh, for an atomic system, because atoms are the systems of interest in this talk, it's the familiar kinetic energy term. So the summation is over the number of electrons n. So this is just electrons kinetic energy, each electrons kinetic energy summed over. And you have uh, classical Coulombic potentials where the i electron interacts with the nucleus and then two electrons talk to each other via this pairwise uh, Coulomb interaction. So uh, fairly straightforward, we have constructed this Hamiltonian for an atom. So we just have to solve for the wave function. The catch is of course, for the simplest systems, there are no exact solutions. So what we do is basically resort to approximate methods. So then the problem slightly changes. Uh, we choose an approximate quantum anybody theory, solve the Schrodinger equation, get the wave function, and then get some property of interest to you by solving an expectation value. And there are other alternatives like energy derivatives, but of course, we're just discussing the most straightforward kind of an approach where we just, uh, just show that, okay, we need an expectation value. Now, uh, since that is done, now we can just look, look at it in a little more detail. Uh, we'll begin with the Hamiltonian and then go to the wave function. So this is just the Hamiltonian that you saw on the previous slide, but I've just regrouped it this way. The idea being that you see just one index that occurs in this term, and then there's an index i that again occurs in this term, because it's the i electrons kinetic energy and the i electron interacting with the nucleus. So when you use a prescription to go over from this form to a second quantized form, you, you get this expression. AP, that AP and AQ are the familiar creation annihilation operator. So AP dagger is creation and AQ is an annihilation operator. This HPQ, it's called a one body integral. And basically they involve uh, integrals containing the spin orbitals P and Q and these relevant operators. Uh, something similar can be done for the electron-electron interaction term too, but it's second quantized uh, counterpart looks like this. This is of course called the two body integral just as this is called the one body integral. Uh, an important thing to notice here is that the summation is over the number of electrons in our more intuitive and familiar Hamiltonian. Uh, 
This is perhaps less intuitive, but a much more powerful framework where people work with many body theory. The second context, the summation is not over the number of electrons. It's over the number of spin orbitals that you have in the calculation. So what you have is your spin orbitals is, is going to comprise of the number of occupied spin orbitals, as well as the number of virtual ones. And the reason why we make this kind of a distinction will become clearer when we discuss uh, many body theory in the subsequent slides. So I'll come back to this point later. But at this point, it's, it's important to note that uh, there are quite some changes that are happening when you go over from this form to this. Okay, so now let's go to the wave function. The starting point is uh, almost always a mean field approach. Uh, in this particular case, the Hartree-Fock uh, approach, where the Hartree-Fock wave function is just described as a slater determinant comprising of these spin orbitals. And uh, the important thing to note here is that Hartree-Fock equations can be derived from rayleigh ritz variational principle. Uh, the reason why this is good is because the energy that you thus obtain is guaranteed to be an upper bound to the true ground state energy of the system. So this has been discussed in a lot of detail and very nicely in the previous edition of QIQT by Professor Manu Pratap Das. So I would recommend that the students go back to this lecture to uh, sort of understand this in more detail. But at this point, it suffices to tell that it's a very powerful uh, framework where you know that the energy you obtain is an upper bound to the true ground state energy. So of course the equation equations are complicated inter integral differential equations. So you recast it in the matrix form, but uh, you always choose a single particle basis. The number of spin orbitals that go from one to D that you saw in the previous slide, that, and then you solve the equations. Uh, I call it a mean field approach here because the interpretation is that every electron in an atom or a molecule, wh whichever system you choose, will see an average potential due to the remaining N minus one electrons in the system. Whereas what you really want to capture is this each electron talking in a pairwise way to another electron. So the remaining N minus N electrons, instead you go for a mean field approach. So this is of course very approximate. And uh, you define electron correlation as those physical effects that are contained beyond the mean field approach. And you begin with the Hartree-Fock theory, a mean field theory, and then you want to incorporate electron correlation effects in them by some suitable theory, where you build over and above the Hartree-Fock approximation. So that's, that's basically the route we often take. So it's just what I told now that I've written in this slide. So all the physical effects beyond Hartree-Fock are called electron correlations. Uh, and now we'll come to this idea of a single particle basis here. The point is when you talk about electron-electron interaction, which you can think of as scattering in real space, it can always be recast in an orbital picture as excitations, virtual excitations that happen from occupied to unoccupied spin orbitals, which, which are what you choose. The number of occupied and unoccupied orbitals and their exponents you choose in your single particle basis. But once you do, you can think of this electron-electron interaction as being described by this kind of virtual excitations. So that's that's basically the idea of a single particle basis. Set. And there are various ways to capture electron correlation effects. Uh, we won't be discussing this in today's talk, but this is basically the familiar version of, uh, but, but a more sophisticated many-body version of your uh, time-independent perturbation theory from coursework. CI, which we'll discuss very briefly, couple cluster, which we'll discuss in a bit more detail, because when we do VQE, we choose what's called the unitary couple cluster ansatz. Okay. So now we'll begin with CI, or configuration interaction. The, the idea here is that any arbitrary n electron wave function can be written as a linear combination of all possible slated determinants that you construct from a given single particle basis. So let's say you have a single particle basis with i, j, k, and, and so on, denoting the occupied spin orbitals, a, b, c, et cetera, denoting the unoccupied ones. Then all the possible slater determinants that you can construct uh, that arise out of one particle, one hole, or two particle, two hole, and so on excitations from the Hartree-Fock state a linear combination of these should be able to describe an arbitrary and electron wave function. So if you begin with this, you will see that the form of the equations that you solve would look like this. Familiar, but very expensive. So the idea is that if you have a given set of single particle basis functions, and if you take into account all possible n electron basis functions that come out of this, which means you take into account all possible slater determinants that you can construct out of a given single particle basis, where the excitations happen from the Hartree-Fock state, then you call that FCA. This is very expensive because the bigger and bigger your single particle basis set is, the faster the number of determinants is going to grow and the more expensive it becomes. But in this particular case of quantum computing or quantum simulation, it becomes relevant because we are in the NISC era, the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, where we have much fewer qubits, qubits available for us. So for small systems, you can use FCA for benchmarking purposes. And this we will come back to when we look at RSI. So that's, that's the motivation we are introducing FCA here. But having said that, we need something between Hartree-Fock and FCA. Uh, when we want to carry out our calculations. And that takes us to couple cluster method. Uh, and by something that's in between Hartree-Fock and FCA, what I mean is that given a level of truncation that you perform, uh, your uh, particular many body theory should be able to do very well. So couple cluster does that. And it's called the gold standard of electronic structure calculations in quantum chemistry. 
the idea is that you again start with your hartree fock state and then you build on it by making this exponential operator act on your hartree fock state and that should give you your uh, final wave function uh, note that this e part t is not unitary so we are going to make this appropriate change when we go over to uh, quantum computing where instead of t we work with t minus t dagger Five. which in turn makes this unitary and thus implementable on quantum computers so here t is given by t1 plus t2 up to tn where each t takes into account uh, these particle hole excitations so t1 for example would take into account one particle one hole excitations where uh, there is one spin orbital in the occupied that goes to some unoccupied with a particular weight factor associated with it you take into account all of these likewise for t2 and as this picture shows you can have two independent single excitations given by t1 square so if you're going to take into account all of these possible uh, occupied to unoccupied kind of virtual excitations and you account for overcounting and all that then you will see that an exponential structure naturally arises so ucc unitary coupled cluster theory is not all that different in its overall structure just that you want to make this operator unitary e part t minus t dagger so this this form arises basically and this is the ansatz that we are going to implement in our uh, vqe algorithm so I, i think this is like a very quick and brief introduction to uh, quantum many body theory so we saw what the overall idea in quantum many body theory is uh, how we were, go over to the second quantized formalism and we saw hartree fock then we saw fci which will use for benchmarking our results and then the couple cluster this unitary counterpart so this this we have covered now so now we'll go to the next part of the talk where we'll discuss the vqe algorithm uh, this this of course you should you should be familiar with that quantum computing gives you a promise of speed up for certain problems it's called the quantum advantage and uh, for quantum chemical problems that is when you want to do atomic molecular calculations and so on the the quantum algorithm that you go to is the phase estimation algorithm this this was discussed in detail in dr kawashima's talk last year and and also in professor rahul's talk today uh, this is a quantum algorithm it gives you a super polynomial speed up and this is for the future because it, it does become expensive when you go to heavier systems but in view of us being in the nisc era uh, we will discuss about the more nisc friendly so to speak vqe algorithm It's, it's not a pure quantum algorithm it's a classical quantum hybrid and we'll see what i mean by this in the next slide but the v which stands for variational is very important so we again come back to the variational principle where we say that the energy that we thus obtain would be an upper bound to the true ground state energy the the difference here is that when you write down the familiar expression for energy you are parameterizing the wave function these thetas are parameters and you're going to optimize these parameters that that's that's the overall uh, idea here so uh, okay maybe when i go to the next slide i'll tell you what what i really mean by this but uh, you you substitute psi with a unitary operator which is which is where all the parameter dependence goes in and that acts upon your hartree fock wave function and, and of course this is going to be your uh, ucc ansatz your e part t minus t dagger that you saw in the earlier slide so like i said earlier traditional couple cluster method uh, has this e part t which is not a unitary operator And, and we are going to do gate based quantum computing so just added this adjective just to say that this is not really annealing but we are going to do gate based so we adopt a unitary version of this operator for the ucc uh, ucc ansatz and ucc satisfies the variational principle what we'll do is of course work with the ucc in the singles and doubles approximation but the hope is that e even if you truncate this to ucc sd you still expect that okay whatever i get should still probably be an upper bound to the true ground state energy so that that's what basically what basically happens here. uh so this is just a pictorial pictorial representation of the vqe algorithm it's a classical quantum hybrid so some some steps are carried out on classical computers some steps are carried out on a quantum computer this is the familiar expression for energy that you saw on the previous slide where all i have done is substituted for psi u theta acting on phi not and we are going to use the ucc ansatz ucc sd ansatz for u theta here that is this so this expectation value evaluation happens on a quantum computer this here is where quantum circuits and all that comes into play but you need to supply inputs you need to first do hartree fock calculations and you have to supply the one and two electron integrals to this the one and two electron integrals are the same familiar objects that we saw in the very beginning of this talk hpq and hpqrs so these calculations are done on a classical computer these are fed in here to a quantum computer and for an initial set of guess parameters you evaluate this and take it to an optimizer and then you update your parameters depending on whatever your choice of classical optimizer is and this is repeated until you reach a minimum so this is just shown pictorially here so at the end of the day vq is basically this optimization problem where you have e theta versus theta theta here is not one parameter but a whole set of parameters that have just collapsed to one uh, for for just showing it diagrammatically and uh, in in this particular case where we use the ucc sd ansatz your t amplitudes which which i showed here these are your thetas this tia stij abs and so on so they play the role of thetas and and as they keep getting updated iteration after iteration you start somewhere and then you start descending 
and the hope is that you finally hit some minimum and because this respects the variational principle whatever finally you get uh, for this minimum energy uh, for the ground state energy from vq that should be an upper bound to the true ground state energy so a very nice discussion of this with hands on tutorials i think was again presented in the last year edition of this conference by debashish farida and uday singla so again those students who are uh, watching this talk I, i would recommend that you also uh, look at their talk for a very detailed and nice hands on kind of uh, a uh, tutorial on vqe okay so now we have seen quantum many body theory very briefly and vqe very briefly uh, so now we will look at what the motivation of doing ionization energy is but before we go to that we'll see what our long term goals are so we we are from a quantum many body theoretic background we do atomic and molecular calculations in our groups but most of our applications of atomic and molecular calculations are aimed at probing what's called non accelerator particle physics um so most of you are familiar with particle physics and accelerators that are used to probe particle physics like lhc and so on where you work with really really large energies but uh, something that is relatively unknown is non accelerator particle physics where you constrain all these beyond standard model uh, theories you constrain all their parameter spaces but instead of just using accelerators you can also use atoms and molecules and this is a very beautiful field because the experiments themselves are low energy experiments you don't need an accelerator for these experiments but of course the trade off is that you need to carry out very high precision experiments so that's that's where all the difficulty comes but the power of this method can be seen by this statement where you where this can actually probe new physics that even can lie in the pitta electron old scales and and for some kind of a comparison lhc is somewhere around 10 tev doesn't mean to tell that this is superior to lhc more often than not you need bounds from both these approaches so that's that's basically this field so i am not doing much justice by introducing this field in one sentence but that's the overall perspective now one such particle physics property that you can explore using atomic and molecular calculations is what's called the electric dipole moment of the electron so you can think of the electron but it as having an electric dipole moment so its charge distribution is no longer spherically symmetric but it's slightly distorted to the first order in the multipole expansion so it has an electric dipole moment and this is cp violating this basically translates to violating time reversal symmetry so it sort of becomes an exotic property it's not been detected yet but experiments atomic and molecular experiments that try to detect this property uh, they require a combination of uh, both theory and experiment and uh, the theory contribution involves doing high precision relativistic quantum many body theory calculations the type of quantum many body theory theory that we saw earlier in this talk on classical computers and in particular a quantity of interest is some sort of an electric field which we call the effective electric field but the point is it cannot be measured in experiment so you only have to calculate it using theory and the reason why i am telling all this is because these are very compute intensive why because most of the systems that you use for these kind of calculations are heavy and just for perspective we'll talk about some of our recent work where we propose some new candidates for these sort of experiments all of them are single valence systems uh, lorentzium is a super heavy atom so you can see that these are very heavy already mercury again as an atomic number of 80 so these are all really heavy systems that you work with but these are good candidates and the hope is that uh, these will do very well and give a uh, lot of insights into physics new physics uh, when these experiments are carried out but they are compute intensive simply because of this you need accurate calculations but you also need to carry them out on heavy systems and they have to be relativistic but uh, when somebody comes and then tells us that okay but if you use quantum computers instead of classical computers Uh, and uh, quantum chemical calculations uh, can experience a lot of speed up if you work with quantum computers obviously it's it's great news for us so this is one of the motivations main motivations why we got into quantum computing but having said that there are several challenges ahead so this this all sounds very complicated because big systems you need relativistic calculations there will be many many spin orbitals lot of excitations to deal with you need to work with high quality single particle bases and so on but uh, keeping this long term in mind this perspective in mind we first began by carrying out some pilot studies using the vqe algorithm uh, we chose atoms in particular although i mentioned molecules here and our final goal is to do molecular calculations simply because atomic systems have it it has so happened that they are very less explored territory in the field of quantum computing and there's a whole host of landscape with a whole host of applications that are not being explored so we thought yeah nothing path breaking nothing new but it's just that it's completely unexplored and if you can do atomic calculations using quantum simulations and quantum computers it's going to throw a lot more insight in these set of fields and open new doorways to these sort of applications that involve atomic systems so that that's basically the motivation we had when we first began with pilot studies using atomic systems so we chose very simple systems uh we chose very low quality bases like the minimal ones uh, these names don't mean anything so for the students don't worry about what these mean just know that these are very low quality bases sets and these are somewhat slightly better quality 
and we are restricted to this kind of a quality because uh, even if you go to the 631g whatever it means it already becomes an 18 qubit computation and an 18 qubit computation is still very costly in the current era uh, on top of it since we are going to use the uccsd ansatz you're going to end up with what are called deep circuits which means you're going to have a lot of gates to deal with many many gate operations so your simulation again becomes very expensive on top of it, since we are interested in precision at the end of the day, so our goals are specific, right? We want to work with uh, single valence atoms and molecules. We want to use it for fundamental physics, and we are looking for very precise results. So even when we begin with straightforward pilot studies of very light atomic systems in low quality bases, we thought we could at least begin with all electron calculations and not cut off any virtuals for any kind of simplification. So 18 qubit calculations with these was already sort of challenging, so we didn't go beyond that. But the goal was to, of course, assess the precision of uh, atomic ground state energies using VQE. And we assess precision within each of these basis sets because these basis sets are of such poor quality that you can't really compare it with, uh, I mean, okay, not for ground state, but eventually when you go to other properties, you can't really compare it with the experiment. So we thought the best we could do is to compare it with FCA value. So you sort of benchmark these results uh, with the FCA value that you obtained for that particular single particle basis set. Uh, we also studied the effect of electron correlations by first getting the Hartree-Fock value. Of course, classical, no VQE involved there. We also did UCC calculations on a classical computer, CC and FCA calculations too on a classical computer, and sort of benchmarked, benchmarked our results. We also looked at various sources of error. Basically, what we did is tune the various knobs, so to speak, of the VQE algorithm, those that I have mentioned here below. The ansatz we fixed because when we tried the other alternative hardware efficient ansatz, we really didn't get great results uh, when it came to capturing correlations. I've just not mentioned it in this talk, so we stuck to this finally. Four basis sets, three different maps. So you saw the second quantized formalism that I introduced in the beginning of this talk, but before you put it all on a quantum computer, you have to convert these. You have to transform the second quantized creation annihilation fermionic operators uh, into, say, a string of tensor products of polygates, which you can then implement on a quantum computer or on a quantum circuit. So the transformation happens via either jordan Wigner or parity or gravity or transformation. The names don't matter, but the idea is that there are different ways to transform it. And when you look at the simulator, there are different ways to get your final answer. State vector simply relies upon matrix vector calculations. So if you repeat the experiment each time, you're going to get exactly the same result. But you're still not, not even emulating an ideal quantum computer with state vector, but you're sort of there. So what we also did is go beyond state vector and do calculations on what's called the quasim backend on Qiskit. We use Qiskit most of these for most of these ones. So I'm just using the same name for the backend, quasim backend. But the idea is that you end up running into the error due to the number of shots. So then we also had to make detailed studies of how many number of shots we need to choose and how many repetitions we make. So sort of get a statistical handle on these things to then narrow down on what sort of precision we can achieve. Uh, we tried the standard Kobila optimizer, which is sort of like Nelder Mead, but much more sophisticated. But we did try our hand with other optimizers, just not mentioned it here. So this was more of a detailed study of all the knobs of a VQE algorithm and how you can achieve good precision in your just simple ground state energies of straightforward atomic systems, closed shell, but by tuning these knobs. So this was published very recently in Quantum Report. So this, this basically, I, I hope I managed to give an overview of this work. Uh, now I'll finally get to the ionization energy part after all this. So uh, the, the idea of doing ionization energies was again, okay. So we did closed shell atomic systems. So the next extension is of course going to those atomic systems where there is one unpaired electron, but you have to obviously make suitable modifications in your programs to accommodate single valence systems. So we did that. Uh, but once we did it, then the next question is, okay, so how good is this? So we thought that uh, as an assay, we could also study ionization energies. Uh, the idea being that without using an EOM kind of a formalism, if you're just going to use the traditional VQE approach, find the ground state energy of a single valence atom, find the ground state energy of a closed shell atom, and then take the difference. That should be able to, pro that should be able to, you know, VQE should be able to predict it to very good precision. Uh, the idea being that if VQE makes a mistake, so to speak, in uh, predicting the trends in either of these, uh, single, single unpaired uh, electron atom or the closed shell atom, the trends should change. And if the trends change, the reflection would be much more on the energy, on the ionization energy, because ionization energy requires you to take difference of two energies. So if one of them is not captured well, the net ionization energy will become a mess. So we thought this would be kind of a nice test to see the versatility of the VQE algorithm on route to our final goal of going towards fundamental physics. So this is, this is just an immediate extension of the first pilot study that I told about. Uh, here also we use FCI for benchmarking our results. Here too, we choose four uh, low to okay-ish quality sort of basis. Same all electron calculations and no virtual cutoffs. Uh, but we chose our systems. So in the previous work, we chose based on just isoelectronic configuration. So we thought it would be nice if we have one neutral 
one positively charged and one negatively charged. Of course, the correlation effects are not the same when you go to their isoelectronic charged counterpart. So we thought it would be a nice study. I'm not getting into the details, but this, this broadly was our motivation. Here we thought uh, we could choose systems based on slightly dissimilar correlation effects. Of course, in its traditional form, VQE is not all that great for capturing very strong correlation effects, but somewhat strong correlation effects, we still thought it should do a reasonable job. So we chose from weak to somewhat strong kind of correlation effects, and then we saw what systems we could choose. So keeping that in mind, along with these constraints of having all electron calculations with no virtual cutoff and all that, and then wanting to do atomic systems, we finally chose a whole host of systems, basically. Uh, the other thing that motivated us was there are certain heavy atoms that are of interest to fundamental physics. So we thought, okay, maybe because the correlation effect, the magnitudes are different, but the hope is that the dominant individual correlation term should not be all that different. So we thought it would be nice if we take lighter counterparts of those heavy systems that we are interested in. So th these are the sort of considerations that motivated us to choose these systems. Uh, I'm not going to get into too many details. I'll again keep this very short, but uh, just to give some sort of a perspective, I thought I could provide these two quick results. Uh, here I'm just listing all these systems that we worked with. Some of them are ionic, some of them are neutral, but you see that most of them are really light and the heaviest that we are going to is aluminum. Uh, these are with the minimal STO3G basis. So the, the highest we have gone up to is just a 18 qubit calculation. And uh, the y-axis is basically the percentage fraction difference with respect to FCI energy. That is, you take the FCI energy, uh, subtract away the VQE energy from it, and then divide by FCI energy and multiply by 100. So because you're covering a whole range of systems, right? So lithium plus has a ground state energy of say 6 AU or something. Six hatteries or the atomic units of uh, the, the energy in atomic units. And uh, AL has something like 260 or 270 hatteries. So it, it spans a wide range. So it, it sort of made sense to work with the percentage fraction difference to see how well it uh, performs with respect to FCI. All of this is in one basis, STO3G basis. So if it's very close to zero, it means that it's, it does very well and it's very close to FCI. So this sort of tells us that not only for closure systems, but also some one unpaired electron systems, it does really well. Uh, boron and carbon plus seem to be a bit of exceptions, but again, not the y-axis. This We are still talking about 0.05% and within. So uh, VQE still does pretty well, but compared to these systems, boron is quite far off. And the reason is simply that uh, the kind of correlation effects that are present in boron and carbon plus, they are slightly stronger. So boron has a 1s2, 2s2, 2p1 configuration. So the 2s, 2p half correlations are quite strong in boron. So uh, that is why with traditional VQE, you still don't get this good a precision, but slightly off. But, but like I said earlier, the choice of these systems were based on what we wanted to expect, you know, with dissimilar correlation effects and see how well VQE does with them. So we still felt that get, getting within 0.05% is pretty good. Uh, note that I'm not talking in terms of milli hatteries here, because usually one looks for milli hatteries precision. Uh, I'm not talking about whether we got sub milli hatteries or milli hatteries simply because it, it, it still involves a range of systems with fairly different number of electrons, right? So if you take lithium plus, it's just two electrons. Whereas uh, aluminum is going to have, uh, uh, it's, it's like boron, right? So it's next to boron. So 11, yeah, 12 maybe, right? So how many, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1, right? That's aluminum. So, so you see that there's a huge difference in the number of electrons. So instead of talking about whether we get a milli hatteries precision or not, we thought it's better we talk about percentage fraction difference. Why? Because you're going to talk about milli hatteries precision in six hatteries versus milli hatteries precision or more in something like 270 hatteries. So that's that's basically the rationale behind uh, working with this. But, but of course, at some point, if someone wants to know, then we can still discuss in the language of milli hatteries precision. So just to give an idea of how these things pan out, we also did some detailed study of the correlation effects, but I'll skip those for the purposes of this talk. Uh, the second curve shows us something else. So here, instead of sticking to one basis set, I've just taken all these four basis sets and I've taken the simplest example of lithium and boron because they're very close to each other. Uh, and we are looking at the difference in ionization energies of these two systems. So it's ionization energy of boron minus the ionization energy of lithium. The idea is to just check whether they satisfy the trends that you would expect. You know, for example, in your chemistry textbooks, you would say that, yeah, when we look at the periodic table and when we go from left to right, you would expect the ionization energy to increase uh, with, with some exceptions. But here, lithium and boron are not really in the category of exceptions. So that's why we didn't choose beryllium. But you would expect boron to have more ionization energy, right? I mean, even intuitively, although it's not the best way to think about these, just to get some kind of an intuitive feel, you would expect that uh, uh, the boron nucleus is going to have more nuclear charge as compared to lithium. 
So you would expect the outermost electron to be held tighter because th there is not too much difference in the number of electrons between lithium and boron. You know, so one is three, another is five. So you you would expect boron to have a higher ionization energy. It is indeed the case. So when you take the difference between the ionization energies of boron and lithium, you would expect it to be positive. But uh, if you look at it for the lowest quality basis sets, they actually come out to be negative. So when we look at where the problem comes, it is not in VQE that you have the problem because if you look at the higher quality basis sets, things work out pretty much fine. But rather the quality of the basis set itself that has been chosen. How do we know this? The correlation effects are fairly stable here. So this this forms some sort of an indicator of hopefully not much going wrong in terms of correlation effects. But if you take the ratio of what energy you get for just at the Hartree Fock level uh, for three to one G and then compare it with STO six G, you see that there's a huge gap between these two. So even at the level of Hartree Fock, uh, you don't get good predictions here. Leave alone correlation, which is where VQE comes into play. So yeah, sometimes when you use low quality basis, you can run into this problem where the trends can be reversed, but this is not so much to do with VQE, but more to do with the quality of the basis and so on. So just to illustrate that we did some kind of analysis that were more on these lines, uh, just so that you disentangle different effects and uh, try to see how well VQE does with trying to you know take out as much as possible the other factors such as the quality of the basis and so on. So that's just to give that sort of an idea, I, I thought I could give this a plot and this is where the experiment stands. Uh, but not not the experiment on each, but the difference between two experimental values. So th this is a very recent work which we just submitted. So I, I think I'll I'll stop discussing this here. Uh, now we'll look at conclusion and future outlook. Uh, of course, VQE does pretty well, but the final goal for us is to look for uh, those sort of atomic and molecular properties where we can probe new physics uh, using atoms and molecules. Uh, and just just for completeness, you get at most one milli Hartree precision if you use state vector kind of backends. And you will run into at most 10 milli Hartree kind of precision for quasim, but this is not as bad as it appears because you have to keep in mind the huge number of shots that you require and the huge number of uh, repetitions that we do even for a given number of shots to get a good handle on the statistics of the calculation involved. And the third is, of course, when you go to systems like sodium aluminum, 10 milli Hartree is probably not that bad. Yeah, I mean, uh, given that we are still in very initial stages and uh, not, not meaning our group, but given that uh, the number of qubits is still so low. Uh, in the NISCARA and so on, I think 10 milli Hartree is probably not all that bad with the Poisson backend for heavier systems, relatively heavier systems. Uh, just one quick comment that uh, we did see that 321G could be slightly better than STO6G. Again, like I said to the students, the names don't matter really, but the idea is that uh, this basis here and this basis here, they would be 10 qubit calculations if you were to do it for say beryllium, but these two would then become 18 qubit calculations. So you use eight qubits more. And when you do a quantum simulation on a classical computer, you're going to expend a lot more computational time for every qubit that you add, right? Because the state space grows very, very fast. Uh, but if you find that these two predict comparable energies, then the question is, okay, why not really use STO6G instead of 3 to one g because we save on eight qubits. In, in some cases, this was indeed the case, but just as this graph shows, if you're going to look for sensitive things like ionization energy, then even if the ground state energies don't look all that different, those small differences are going to translate into something bigger when you calculate properties like uh, ionization energy and so on. So I just thought I could add this coming quickly here. So of course, we saw that VQE is very versatile, but we have a very long way to go. So the two studies that I told you are really pilot studies, which are pretty straightforward, but uh, uh, which basically which, which basically are based on the fact that atoms have so many applications, but they are so unexplored. So we, we will continue working on atomic systems, but of course, our goal is to start incorporating the effects of special relativity into our calculations when we start running on actual quantum devices. So whatever I showed you are just simulations. So when we start running on quantum devices, which we will begin very, very soon, we have to factor in noise, mitigate noise and so on. And of course, work with faster variants of VQE to accommodate bigger and bigger systems, right? I mean, we went till sodium, aluminum, yes. But if you think of say, for example, potassium or what's, what's after aluminum, gallium, uh, this is just not going to work out because even with the STO 3G basis, you will run into 24 or 26 qubits. So you need to start looking for faster variants of VQE and so on. So these are all the directions in which we plan to move in the near future itself. And we feel it's it's very timely and a relevant time to work on these because the number of qubits are fast increasing. So IBM has told that they will release IBM Condor next year. And uh, the recent modified roadmap does tell that they're going to go very, very fast towards this goal. So yeah, so this, this, is, this is where things stand currently. Uh, I'll just comment a bit on the ongoing and future work. Of course, Professor Rahul already spoke about uh, about uh, IQP over VQE, ICC, SDN. So I, I'm not talking about it here. But uh, in the context of this talk, we want to probe fundamental physics using quantum simulation computing. 
we have just started looking at quantum annealing, which is which is not really a gain based formalism, but the other model of quantum computing. Well, we have started looking at different variants of VQE, which would probably not be so costly as VQE when you go to larger systems. We have started looking into possibilities of spin-free formalisms. And uh, there's a very interesting application that we are also working on, on fluid dynamics, if you like. The idea being that uh, you could use another algorithm called the HHL algorithm to solve systems of linear equations. So if you can really recast your problems, especially those that you see in climate science and climate modeling, in a, in a form that is amenable to use in the HHL algorithm, then you can start doing climate modeling using quantum computers. So this is something that we are doing in collaboration with a, a group in, ja in Japan, Janstech. So these are broadly what is what are happening at our center and what we plan to do. Uh, with, with this, I think I come to the end of my talk. I think I finished well, well before time, but I'll just spend the last one or two minutes talking about our center because TCG Crest is, is, is a new institute and our center is still less than two years old. It was less than a year old last year. Uh, but in the last one year, since the last QAQT, our center has been growing steadily. So we have groups doing both experiment and theory. And on the experimental front, we have just begun work on uh, both and uh, quantum computing platform as well as a superconducting qubit platform. And theory is, of course, mostly whatever I just discussed here, and then we plan to do more. Uh, also, recently, one of the proposals from METI got accepted. So we have got quantum computing time on three different computers. And so the theory work is also progressing quite fast. And of course, our, our main focus is strong national and international collaboration. So we would be very happy. Uh, it would be very nice if we can collaborate on various problems uh, in theory and experiment. And these are some of our current collaborators in PRL Ahmedabad. IIT Bombay is Professor Rahul, IIT Gauhati, Osaka City University, University of Tokyo, CQT Singapore, and so on. So, so currently, our team is, is growing. So we have five faculty members now, four postdocs. We have a computational research fellow and many interns. And we also are visiting faculty members from various places. So if, if you are interested, then please go look at our uh, website for a lot more nice details. And yes, as I said, we are would be very happy to collaborate on various problems. And uh, just before, just to conclude, I thought I could show some very nice pictures of our center. So this is the building which houses our center. Uh, we already have some nice blackboard discussions with uh, students and postdocs and so on. This is our classroom where we plan to have uh, hybrid mode uh, classrooms because our PhD program. Uh, in uh, with an MOU with IIT Tirupati will begin very soon. So from August, our program begins. And these are our hallways and our uh, discussion lobbies. Uh, this is, of course, the most important of them all, where you get infinite coffee on a coffee machine. So yeah, I guess you have everything for a nice academic environment and a research environment. So I, I think I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. OK, thank you. So the session is now open uh, for questions. So please ask. So uh, just one question. One question. Oh, sorry, yes. yes. In the chat, what do you mean by the quality of basis? Uh, uh, I I am just trying to avoid uh, giving a mathematical description, but uh, very roughly, a quality of a basis ends up deciding the quality of your results. So if you choose a high quality basis, which usually ends up having many more functions in there, you're going to get better results, which means more accurate results, be it energy or be it property. But having said that, this is a very, very rough way of putting it. But, but of course, if you want a more technical answer, then we can discuss that too later. But very broadly speaking, this is basically what it is. So for example, STO 6G basis is of a better quality than the STO 3G basis, although both of them have the same number of spin orbitals. Uh, and 3 to 1G is of a better quality than ST or 6G, although you have a huge difference of eight spin orbitals between the two and so on. So, but, but to give some perspective, that's basically what you can think of. A better quality basis means better quality results. Uh, Nitik, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, see, uh, Prasanna, see, when it comes to this gate based VQE, and adiabatic, like DUA kind of thing, what do you think? Which one would be better or eventually what one should do? Ah, that's, that's a difficult question for me to answer. But, uh, but annealing is usually restricted to a smaller set of problems at this point. 
So mm. you can only, uh, it's good for many optimization problems, mm. but uh, it is not too clear how you can take it, say, for example, uh, into the domain of doing, say, quantum chemistry kind of problems. Um, mm. Mm. One of the things we are looking at is trying to do quantum chemical problems using Anili. But mm. what happens is, let us say, for example, you use D-Wave, it can only take Ising Hamiltonian. Correct. Correct. But uh, uh, even when you take your electronic structure Hamiltonian and say transform it using Jordan Wigner or any other transformation, you will have a whole string of poly operators that are really not at all close to icing. So Correct. we have to do a whole lot of work in transforming that to icing before you implement it on D wave. Uh, but the price you pay there is you have to incur a lot of ancilla qubits in order to make such a right. transformation. Then the cost becomes unclear and the scaling becomes unclear. But these these are hopefully the aspects that we plan to study in the coming one year. Okay. But at this point, it looks like uh, the traditional gate based has much more applicability. But uh, mm. I, I guess Aniling is picking up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So any more questions? Okay. Let us again thank Professor Prashanna for his interesting lecture. Thank you, Professor Prashanna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, with this, we, uh, we are welcoming Professor uh, Devashri Ghosh uh, from ICS Kolkata. She, she has done her PhD from Cornell University and uh, uh, she is one of the eminent quantum chemists in the, chem, chemist in the world. And uh, she is uh, she is uh, one of the developer developers of the quantum chemistry soft software you came and she has got multiple in national and international awards and recently she got international academy of quantum molecular science award with this we welcome professor Ghosh. professor Ghosh, the windows is yours please thank you for the very kind invitation uh, invitation and the very kind uh, introduction uh, I'm, I'm i'm audible Yes, you're ready. Okay, so I'll start, try sharing my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, great. So I want to uh, just ask once, I'm mostly talking to uh, students, right? Yes. Okay. Great. So I, I will try to explain things in as much detail as possible. Okay, so um, I am, as uh, it, it was mentioned before, I am a quantum chemist, essentially. Um, and so the language I'm going to use is mostly going to be of quantum chemistry. So um, I'm going to talk about matrix 